the meeting to order, and at this time, I would like to do roll call for the rec commission members only. Tanya Wynn. Mary Pritzker. Mike Sailor. Diane Fenton. Brad Epperly. Court Hall. Jim Williams. And it looks like we have Mike Harris coming in the room as well. Doris Oliver contacted me today, and unfortunately she had some personal issues that came up and will not be able to attend tonight. Okay. I would like to, the previous month's minutes, are there any corrections or concerns about the way they were submitted? Move we approve. Second. Press second. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Okay, at this time, I would like to have any citizens' comments. Okay, if you'd like to stand and introduce yourself and everybody is limited to five minutes. Okay. okay. My name is Jeff Rowland. I'm the founder and director of the New York Rally and Lacrosse Club. This is uh, Katie Williams, who's our vice president, and we're both also coaches at the club. Um, we just, we're coming to see the plan. We're excited. We're looking forward to seeing a plan that's going to allow the most flexible use of an important and valuable recreation space. Um, as everyone knows, field space is shorted, short in the area, in the county. Um, our club by itself is, we've grown 20% over the last five years consistently, and we are looking at building an additional four to probably five teams next year alone. So that's, you can imagine, four to five more practice fields that we would need. Um, so we were uh, looking forward to, a, like I said, a place that will allow the most flexible use of the fields. Um, I'm glad to see the three full-size multi-purpose fields there. Would really love to see you know, that last dedicated baseball field in a more flexible multi-purpose field or the opening up or maybe considering the outfield use as shorter youth size fields or the Hark Ritter complex outfields use as short size fields because there, there is a huge need for multi-purpose youth fields for soccer, um, I would imagine football, and I know for lacrosse. Um, that, that's all we had to say, so thank you. Thank you everyone for your work on the project. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Yes, I'd like to call a work session between the Christopher Town Council and the Christopher Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission to order. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to uh, once uh, thank everyone for attending tonight. This is, a, you know, an exciting time for the town of Christiansburg. Um, we've been working hard on the Truman Wilson Park now for a couple of years. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's been a great relationship working with Gay and Neil and uh, their fellow consultants that they've been working with uh, in, in preparing this conceptual master plan that we have before us tonight. Um, it's been great to listen to the citizens' input uh, as well as the steering committee, our recreation commission, uh, as well as town council. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gay and Neil uh, consultants, Mr. Trevor Kim. Good evening. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Brad. <clears throat> uh, we'll do introductions here first, just so we get that out of the way. Uh, we'll start with the Neil of Gay Neil. Uh, John Neil, President of Gay Neil, is here. I'm Trevor Kimsey, Director of Engineering. And you all want to introduce yourself. JD Price. I'm an uh, architect with OWPR. And I'm Kyle Theodore. I am a landscape architect, a park planner, and I work with Empire. All right, just so uh, you can control your excitement, um, the stuff you're really here and excited to hear about, these two are going to share, uh, mine's the necessary part. It's, the, it's kind of the piece to set up how we got here, where we're going, things like this. Um, so, so bear with me. Uh, the best is, is coming in just a minute. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to remind you of the process, how we got here. I know I've touched on this kind of each time we've met, but I think it's important that we don't lose sight of how we got here. And, and what here is, the program, and then we'll show you graphically what these things look like, and then talk about what's here to come, because tonight is not the end of this process. Our scope of services has some yet uh, deliverable to come. The, um, the process. So I'll just fly through the background here. Uh, just across the hall, you remember back in May uh, 2015, we, we began with a public input process, a gather meeting, input from folks like this and others. We also at the same time met with a lot of the uh, rec commission, uh, sort of the staff level steering committee of the town, uh, town council. And, and through all that, we um, started to hear what people wanted. Um, in addition to what the feedback the town was, we also, uh, 
Um, we also then, that summer, <coughs> began a process uh, with the consultant, Pros uh, Consulting, where they studied the demographics and uh, the data about Christiansburg, about the market, that's their business, to understand the market of recreation. What is the market asking for? It's a supply and demand issue like any other uh, um, economic question. And, and they helped us walk through that, and they gave us a report uh, guiding, here's the sort of things the market would want to respond to, here's the things the market's not so interested in. So that coupled with our own, what we wanted in the town of Christopher, the feedback received from here, started to shape up the program. During all that process, uh, uh, engineering surveying was going on. We gathered a complete survey of the park. Um, then kind of moving from uh, out of the summer and into the fall, we, uh, we began to kind of go down the road, excuse the pun, the road of uh, studying the conceptual roadway. This connector corridor through here was uh, really is the spine. Uh, it was critical to get that thing right, get it on the table. And then, uh, interestingly, the timing of this new House Bill 2 funding for VDOT, the HB2 funding applications, drove this process that suddenly, by the end of September, we actually had to have prepared a real strong concept plan of not just the road through the park so we could develop the park, but we need a conceptual cost estimate all the way through the two phases from Pe Pepper Ferry to Cambria, from Cambria all the way down in uh, North Franklin. It was, a, it was a large piece of work that kind of took up some time during the, uh, in that summer and fall. Um, interestingly, so far, positive feedback coming in through the HB2 process. Um, that's still working its way up the chain. Um, all right, so from there, we finally started to do what everybody wanted us to do, which is put pen to paper and start showing some concepts. We took a program that we had, we put the connector corridor in there, uh, we talked about out parcels, and we began to finally start to try to fit the program in. Uh, Kyle and her folks developed uh, four initial concepts, uh, trying to see how to fit it, and it didn't all fit. Uh, we had a preferred one of those. Then we went back to the drawing board and then kind of took that one preferred concept and beat it around a bit and modified it, came up with two variations of what that was and uh, brought it back to everybody again. And out of that, we ended up with concept. Uh, that showed up right before Christmas. We had in our hands at least a draft version of this concept. It wasn't the final version, but it was, a, it was the start. Um, then we rolled into the new year after the holidays were over. We kicked off the building discussion. Started meeting. Um, now we have a plan for the park. We need to look at what the building is going to be. And uh, JD uh, especially worked closely with the uh, Rec Commission and with the um, staff here, <clears throat> walked through those, and in fact, not only just clarify what's in each building, but in one case, we actually came up with a building that we didn't quite yet, amongst all of us, realize needed to be on the plan, and we got that added to the plan. Those things kind of pushed back on the, the plan, the site plan, and started to fit their way in. Uh, and over the last two months, we managed to, uh, we, JD has managed to actually work out the, the building concepts and put these together. And meanwhile, see everything else I'm doing get just lumped into here. The rest of the stuff, uh, it's not as pretty to look at, but uh, uh, thoughts about the traffic study, the roadway, utilities, uh, stormwater management. We've been working on kind of feasibility studies behind the scenes for all of that. Um, and the gas line. We'll touch on more of that in a minute. That's, that's consuming quite a few hours of my time wrestling back and forth with Spectre Energy and uh, trying to get some direction. And uh, you'll see in a minute how that starts to shape the plan. Um, and that was the reason why the actual draft version in mid-December uh, wasn't the final version. We had to make some changes. Um, so that's kind of how we got here. Hopefully the bottom line takeaway is it's been thoughtful, careful, long process, lots of input, give and take. Uh, we didn't just disappear into a vacuum and come back with a plan that you have to live with. It's been a plan that you all helped develop, uh, beginning with this program. And uh, I know I've reviewed this with you before, but I want to review it again because, uh, and actually I'm going to, maybe we'll just do like a class. If you want to just take one and pass it down. This is, uh, this is, I brought a draft marked up version of this back to council in um, November, I believe. <coughs> and presented it, and uh, so now with its uh, no changes to that, this is the final version of the program. But basically, it is the amphitheater, this kind of cultural uh, piece in the middle. It is passive recreation space, between 50% uh, of the program space. Um, picnic shelters scattered throughout. We talk in the program about small, medium, large, 
Um, the act of recreation broke down into two priorities. Uh, that, was, that came directly out of the quantity of feedback received in the public input process from the staff and also from the demographics and the uh, market assessment uh, that pros did. Uh, it really pushed forward this need for more multi-purpose rectangular fields um, and, and but the town was uh, strongly of the opinion that we also still need some softball, so that came on as well, but as a second uh, priority. Also then, it was still the all accessible kind of signature playground, the dog park, uh, trails, both to connect to the obvious Huckberry trail extensions beyond, but also internally trying to create a network of trails. The beach volleyball, um, the splash pad or spray ground, and we'll see more about that in a bit. Um, and of course, the necessary maintenance buildings, those kind of facilities, uh, and the corresponding parking that goes along with all this. All of that is itemized in detail within these. It's what we talked about uh, each of the last times we've met. This is, um, I emphasize it's your program. It wasn't a program that we brought a template from uh, pros, didn't bring a template of what worked great in Indiana or over here in Charlottesville. This is developed from this community based on demographics and input from this community. So um, that's what you're going to see in the program, I mean in the plan. And with, with no further ado, uh, we'll get to the plan. Uh, but first, within the plan, uh, let me lay the framework so you can see, uh, uh, before we get the, the pretty stuff, the, the critical pieces of, uh, I mentioned that we had done this HB2 application. We helped the town staff to walk through that conceptual design all through. Phase one of this project is connector of road. It's not phase one of the car project necessarily. It's, but the first phase of the connector road takes it from Pepper's Ferry Road, right at the intersection of Quinn's through Boulevard, and carries through past Cambria Crossing and ties in down there at Cambria, next to the uh, storage facilities there. Um, then, moving on from there, phase two picks up, and you see that same little roundabout that was at the uh, bottom left of the first page. And now in the top right, that's the, the connection with the roundabout at Cambria. That then carries on and slides in past the back of Lions Gate and Oak Tree and comes all the way out next to the, uh, the bank and the uh, Waffle House at North Franklin, just across from Trinity Baptist. Uh, that is what was kind of going on beside, behind the scenes and sort of outside the box of the park, but it's part of our scope services. We, we were looking at all of that. And, um, and did make some application funding for all that back at the end of September. But uh, now, there's the park and the, uh, the vision for the future. And I'm going to let Kyle walk you through this. Do you want to, I guess the kids walk so it's Kim? Mm -hmm. okay, right. I'm afraid to try to stand up and walk. Right walk these folks are being yeah, Just stand there. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can you move it? Um, so Trevor's covered, covered a lot of ground. And just to orient y'all, because we've looked at so many different diagrams in the past couple of minutes, this is Pepper's Ferry. This is that new connector road he's been talking about. <coughs> this is Cambria Crossing, Wind, Windmill Hills, Windsor Estates. <coughs> this is the Kays Drive area. And then over here, I think which is a landmark, is Merchant's Tire, right in this room. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the things that are on the other side of the proposed connector road, um, which starts closest to Pepper's Ferry with two uh, commercial out parcels of about two and a half acres each. <coughs> they would share a curb cut here off of the new connector road. Um, and an easement would serve, the cross easement would serve this first parcel, and then they'd also have a right in and a right out. So these are commercial out parcels. Uh, a, a small stormwater detention pond. And then we'll come back and talk about this a little bit more in a few seconds. But this is a trailhead um, area, which would be part of the park. And it is uh, a small parking lot, a little picnic shelter, but most importantly, a, a trail connection that gets folks on the Huckleberry Trail. Um, so it's backing up to the, to the Huckleberry Trail here. Um, west of the connector is, is the, really the, the heart of the park. And it's a blending, as Trevor mentioned earlier, one of the uh, uh, program elements was to retain 50% open space. 
And so this is a good diagram to look at to understand that. If you, if you pay attention to this light colored uh, area throughout the park, um, that represents anything that's unstructured, so it's open space, meadows, um, but it, it's not developed as an active use facility. Um, before we move on, I want to mention that we also plan for a buffer that will go all the way around the park on, on these sides. And that would consist of uh, enhanced landscaping and um, some perimeter fencing. Um, and, and then, uh, as Trevor mentioned earlier, um, we did face a little bit of a hurdle with this existing gas line. Um, and there were very specific things that we could and couldn't do uh, based on uh, what we learned from Spectra Energy. And Trevor, you mentioned that. Yeah, I, I won't bore you with the details, but um, I want you to understand how much that was a shaping influence. Uh, as we've talked about multiple times, the gas line that runs, you know, flag it again there, kind of runs sure. from the bottom left to the top, oh. center right there, yeah, all the way through the center of this thing. Um, it is an existing eight inch transmission line. Um, you've probably all seen the gas meter parked between uh, the back of the bookstore and the Walmart parking lot down there um, off 46 business. It's the largest gas meter in the state of Virginia, um, they tell me. <clears throat> and uh, so that gas is serving all of the town of Christopher and Virginia Tech's power plant, which serves them most power to Blacksburg. So it's an important gas line. Um, it cuts through there. There's, uh, we're not allowed to do any cutting of grade over that. Of course, if you've seen the site, it does a lot of this anyways. Um, so we can't cut grades on that at all. <coughs> and then where we can um, fill, we really are limited. They want 10 feet of cover maximum. Most places they have three to five already. There's very tight constraints of what we can accomplish uh, across that gas line. On top of the grade issues, they also uh, insisted as part of the easement they have through there, um, utilities have to cross under it in sort of a perpendicular manner. Um, and then the, uh, the roadways really have to cross as close to perpendicular across this as we can get. So you can't run a roadway diagonally across this easement. Um, so all of those things started to put pressure on uh, our initial, uh, that right before Christmas, the plan we had didn't meet all those criteria. When we finally worked out the grading on it, when we worked out, looked at the layout with them and had several conference calls, they basically kind of said, there's no way we would approve this, this, and this. So we had to start massaging the entrance location, we massaged the parking, uh, we changed some grade. We even lost probably uh, 12 to 20 parking spaces as a result of uh, trying to change the grades conceptually to get off of this thing. Uh, what was all said and done, um, uh, they, they won't approve anything until you're ready to go to construction, but they felt like we had responded well and they, they liked what they saw. The one thing that's important to know is that the connector road, where it, those four lanes of roadway cross the gas line, uh, the grade's already at a big pitch, the gas line's at a big pitch, and we're trying to bring a roadway across there. Uh, effectively, we cannot do that without violating those grade constraints they have. Um, so, the town in this case is going to have to put the bill to redo a piece of that gas line, maybe 150 feet of it across that section. Um, that's the bad news. The bad news is that's expensive and, and it's our burden to deal with. The good news is, oddly enough, and I don't know if it's every couple of decades or something that they do this sort of testing, but this summer in July, they're shutting that whole stretch down and doing some testing on this line. Uh, that involves, they're running several thousand feet, I think thousands of feet of new line to, to bypass this whole region so they can do the testing on this. Uh, so I'm already actively trying to kind of insert us into that process of, oh, wow, you got the line down. Uh, let us come in and replace this thing um, or pay you to do that for us. Again, you're talking about something that even then is six figures. I can't get them to tell me what number that is, but it's not <coughs> tens of thousands. It's, it's over $100,000 to just to deal with that piece. But I... The gist I was giving is you may be looking at seven figures if you had to do this on your own and run your own bypass line and shut the gas line down yourself um, and probably years of planning. So the fact that we have an opportunity, a window opening up this July to deal with that is really uh, make, is incredibly fortunate. And so we're going to uh, insert ourselves into that process and get that taken care of this summer. That was the only place we could not satisfy criteria on the line. The line is, is six feet foot under? Yeah, anywhere from three to five, or even close to seven when you get the railroad in there. Oh, really? Because right. it's plunging down to go under. <coughs> Thanks, Trevor. Um, so we're
that really affected the Street <coughs> area uh, coming into the park. But this is intended to be the primary entrance into the park, and it will be served by a loop road. So it'll come up and loop back around and come back out here. There's a secondary entrance here. This is, again, a full uh, curb cut, which would align with those out parcels that I mentioned, um, and, um, and serve the park. Um, now we're going to zoom in on each of these areas that are outlined with the blue dash um, so it's a little bit easier to see. We're going to look at this area, which is the core area. We're going to look at this area, which is the service area, and there's a dog park. Um, and then I'll uh, show you an enlargement of that trailhead area that I mentioned earlier. And we'll start with the uh, core area. Um, so again, just for orientation purposes, this is that connector road. This is the primary entrance. And as you come in on the primary entrance to your right uh, is a small parking area and then a, a grassy field area uh, which will roll down to a, uh, a new pond. This area will serve as an amphitheater, but it will also just serve as a large open space that's working towards that 50% open space that I mentioned. Um, and the focal point of it will be this open air pavilion, which will be used for, it can be used for concerts. Um, but it can also be used on a daily basis as a large picnic shelter for special events or for uh, corporate outings or family reunions or that sort, that sort of activity. And JD's going to share some imagery of that with you in a few minutes. Um, but again, that backs up to this uh, new pond. And then moving a little bit further along, you come into this, this area of the park, which is a destination playground in this lobe, and then a water park or water park, excuse me, splash pad, or some people call them spray ground on this side. Um, those are both enclosed with uh, enclosure fencing um, for safety purposes, and then they have safety surfacing um, underneath those activities. And serving that is a restroom and um, a pic picnic pavilion. It's really not an open air pavilion, but there is a rental space. Um, that's part of this building um, and has restrooms serving it as well. Just a sure. quick, quick question about the perimeter fencing there between the uh, splash pad and the, um, the signature park. I take it that throughout the entire plan, it's, it's, there's continuity amongst the, 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 for the different, and the fencing is going to be the same similarities between everything. Is that correct? That's a good question. Um, we've actually talked, we, we haven't done any uh, initial planning okay. yet on this. We're, I'd like to get your input um, into that. But we are talking about uh, a more of a, 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 a three rail fence treatment along the connector road, um, marking that this is the park. And then in these sorts of areas, it's a more intense fencing so that kids can't crawl through it. Um, but haven't designed anything yet. And then the perimeter fence that I mentioned that'll go around the perimeter of the property will probably be a different style. It'll probably be more agrarian um, in keeping with what's there now. I was driving around today looking at it and there's just a series of different types of fencing all the way around that perimeter. And um, so we want to bring a little bit of continuity on the park side um, there. That's a really good question. Um, so picking back up um, in the core area here, we've got parking that supports those, uh, the, the uh, destination or iconic um, all-inclusive, um, this is an all-inclusive playground in the splash pad area. And directly adjacent to that is four um, uh, volleyball, sand volleyball courts, um, and then a small picnic shelter um, that would support activity there, as well as a little bit more open lawn area. Again, parking lot directly adjacent to that, um, supporting those activities. Um, I mentioned the splash pad or the spray ground, and um, <coughs> for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, um, this is a project we worked on. It's, in, it's actually in Atlanta, but it's called Fourth Ward Park. Um, and you'll see here an example of a splash pad. Um, and it can, it can occur in two different types. The foreground image here is just of spray jets. And so it's nothing, everything's flush with, with grade, with the exception of the water that jets up. 
Um, the alternative to that is these structures and, and some water jet will come up and spray out the top or in other areas. Um, and so you can, you can have this approach or you can have that approach or you can have a blending of both. But what we highly recommend is trying <coughs> to um, separate age groups, just like on a playground. So you can have a small children's area and then a larger or an older, older children's area. <coughs> but just some examples of what that might look like. Um, now we're going to move into the next area, which is the dog park and support area. Um, that was on the right-hand side of the plan as we looked at it, close to Merchant Tire. Um, and you see an enlargement here of that area. Here's the end of the loop road as it ties back in, and this is the secondary entrance. This is the uh, connector road. You would come in and take a, a spur road that serves that dog park. This uh, light, uh, brightly colored green area represents the dog park. It would be split into two halves, a larger dog area and a small dog area. Both would be, again, enclosed by enclosure fence. And then they would share a, a picnic pavilion with restrooms. Um, and then there's a small parking area that would be directly adjacent to that area. Um, and as you continue on on the spine road, you can eventually get in into um, service area or the maintenance area that would serve a park and um, we've got two buildings as part of that complex all enclosed by a security fence um, and one would be uh, the condition space JD will talk about that in a few more minutes the other would be a pole barn for storage of outdoor materials um, the second diagram in the right hand corner is an enlargement of that uh, trailhead that I mentioned earlier that's directly off the connector road is a small parking lot of a small parking <coughs> pavilion um, connection to the uh, Huckleberry Trail so that folks who are interested in jumping on the trail can come, park your car, and, and get directly on the trail um, here as part of the park. There's about uh, uh, 400, and, oh, okay. 400 to 450 spaces, um, and that includes um, a little uh, area of grass parking right here, which is for overflow uh, parking. We didn't want to pave the whole park. Again, we're trying to focus on that open space, the green space. Um, now I'm going to back up, and I'm going to look at the, the left-hand side of the park, if you will, um, which is where the <coughs> athletic recreation facilities are concentrated. And again, this is starting at the connector road, the primary entrance. We've talked about the uh, amphitheater and pavilion on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, there'll be a, a, a mirror image, a small parking area. And as you move in this road, you'll bypass a 220-foot uh, softball field. There'll be a little bit of a grade change here. Trevor talked about some of the challenges of this gas line. And, one of the uh, challenges that we have is that we'll have a, a, about a 10-foot yeah, retaining, retaining wall. Um, it'll be landscaped and softened, but you'll, you'll be looking up at that uh, softball field as you um, move in the roof road. And then as you continue on, you'll come up into a parking lot, which will serve three multi-purpose uh, rectangular fields. These are all 225 by 360, so the full-size soccer field size. Uh, which will allow you the most flexibility. And they would be um, all enclosed by enclosure fence um, and then served by concession and restroom building as well as a ticketing facility uh, which would allow for uh, use for tournaments if, if that uh, is desired. Um, all of these areas, um, including the areas that I've talked about previously, are interconnected through a perimeter leisure trail. And in this instance, it moves around the outer perimeter of the facility, but it ties into a greater network that runs through the entire park. Um, and it is also supported here by parking. Would you go there again? What do you sure. mean by enclosure fence? Enclosure fence is um, 
controlled access into that particular facility uh, is forced through, through a specific gate or through a ticketed um, venue. Uh, before we move on, I've got a couple oh, questions. Yes. Uh, Greg or Kyle? Kyle. 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 Yes. The fields are proposed to be a crossover, the multi purpose. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. In size for a soccer field, it can also be used, which will also serve as lacrosse or football. Um, and then we indicated, and it's a little difficult to tell in the diagram, but they can also be used for. Um, softball or baseball as well. And, and they would be turf as opposed to uh, grass. Now I've heard a couple times moving on to the softball field. And, and Trevor, you mentioned it in a meeting five months ago, six months ago, and you mentioned it in night. A lot of heat based fields, open space, uh, splash bags, things like that, amphitheater. That was all through a marketing study, but I heard especially tonight it mentioned that the town wanted a softball field. And I mentioned this to council the other night. I was never approached for any input in this. So I guess I'd like to know how we came up with including a softball field in this part. Well, I can talk a little bit about, about this. Um, you know, some of it came from input from our, our previous public input meeting. Um, some of it also came from the standpoint that we really don't have a true softball field in the town of Christiansburg. We have baseball fields at Harkrader with grass stand fields, which is not a true model that's set up for girls softball. Um, the fields that we currently use right now for softball, which would be at Kiwanis Field, um, that field is probably, I think it's like 175, 180 foot. We've got extended fences to try to basically reach the 200 foot to 220 foot item to, to, to basically utilize it for softball, but it's not an ideal situation. Um, Fallen Branch, which is, is two fields that we use, which are not necessarily ours, it's the school systems fields, but we do maintain those fields. Um, the closest thing that we have to that would be the larger field at Fallen Branch, but it's still not the ideal situation of a girl softball field. Um, so from our, you know, from the input that we received from, from some of the folks at the public input meeting, from some of the folks that we've had here within our recreation commission, um, that's where the mindset came from the softball field. The original concept, the first one that they came about, um, back, basically there was a couple different uh, items on there. One of them had three softball fields, one of them had two softball fields, and you know, at the, at the end of the day, basically what we did is we felt like that it was important to go down to having at least one softball field to try to meet some of the needs of the folks that, that play that particular sport, because it was a priority, but it was priority two and we geared most of our focus towards the rectangular fields because it was a priority one. With the three larger fields, we felt as if basically it's gonna be an open artificial surface area so um, we could easily have younger age groups play on six fields on, on the three major fields there. So that's sort of where that came from, from the softball side of it. Could that, could, could that field be like when Hark Raver has their World Series, could that field be used in, in conjunction with the World Series for um, baseball? Are you, are you talking about the, uh, the, the actual skint surface field? Uh -huh. um, yeah. The softball field? Yeah. Um, it could possibly be used. It wouldn't be ideal. Um, okay. You know, the, the, the grass stand fields for a baseball tournament is what you would use for like a World <laughs> Series. We do play on like, like Kiwanis Field and Fallen Branch and in places like that, but that's not your ideal situation. Um, uh, our premier tournament headquarters would be for a baseball World Series would be um, at Harkrader in that particular situation. And, and so yeah, I think you mentioned could this be used for baseball? Is that right for the baseball World Series? Well, that's what I was it, thinking. It, yeah, it, it cannot. It's uh, you know, it, the, the smallest of Harkrader is still about, I would say, 45 feet longer than this on the fence. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this this could be used for like an AU tournament. It could be yeah, very, very young with the first very young, young That's about it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. A yeah. couple of follow ups on this, Brad. The, the other three fields, I mean, you know, the lacrosse, the soccer, business there, the football. And with those, that, is that something that could be used for tournaments, particularly with, with girls' softball tournaments as well? Sure, sure. Okay. Absolutely. And then that, 
I mean, I, I just like to say something about that. I mean, Christiansburg's doing a lot in baseball. Softball has been a little bit tougher. And, and while we have some great fields, and there are good fields and stuff like that, the ones at the school, the restroom facilities has been somewhat of a drawback here. And I think that this would probably solve some of that. So, you know, we know, I guess the travel sports has been pretty, pretty big. Well, I think if I understand correctly in, in talking to Brad, these will all be turf fields. So even though you see a layout of an infield, all, all you're going to do is that's just erase it when it's over with and you turn it back into a multi-purpose field. That, that's correct. I mean, the, the, it'll basically just be an open artificial surface area. And, and you know, what you would need is, a, uh, as far as the maintenance <coughs> of an artificial surface area, is basically a grooming machine. And if you would paint it, you would take the lines off if you wanted to. Those types of things. As um, far as the rectangular fields go, that's correct. I think that there's going to be some permanent lining, obviously, on the big rectangular fields for the soccer and for, I imagine, that would improve. You can do a number of things. Actually, what uh, what we did at Virginia Tech recently, a uh, similar design, but twice as big, basically, uh, they just put one single white box around the outline of that rectangle. Just that 225 by 360. That's it. Everything else is temporary. They paint it on. I mean, temporary meaning it can last months, but they'll paint it on and run one sort of season or something, and they can strip it off and put something else on. But you don't have to play softball looking at soccer, goalie boxes, or any of that. It's just, it just wouldn't be in your way. It's up to you how you do it. But that would yeah. be, if you want the ultimate flexibility, that, that gives you the opportunity to do something. Generally, what, what you would do in that situation is, you know, I know we have some folks from lacrosse here. If, if um, you know, if, if we've got three fields going for as far as lacrosse goes, we would be painting that lacrosse field in a certain color. Then we would paint also a soccer field in a certain color. So that there's discrepancies between the both, so that soccer could use it, lacrosse could use it. If we have football, we have football that they could use it. So it would basically be different colors, so that you could justify the multi-purpose use. Is there any talk? Are there going to be lights to extend the hours of it on any of the fields? Uh, the, the, the plan is uh, currently is that that each of these fields would be lit. Fred, is there? I mean, you're. Basically, the rec department's going to put the policies together for practices, games, things like that. Since they are a true multi-purpose field, even though they're a crossover for softball, uh, and the need base is for our private clubs, which is the soccer club, Christopher Soccer Club, and the lacrosse, and I'm glad Jeff and Katie could be here tonight and talk about how the, their programs are gaining uh, popularity. But the soccer program, especially, is one of our largest, and it's private programs in the area. I guess, how do you envision, how are you going to sort of divvy up time? Because if, well, because if, if they're crossover into softball fields, I mean, uh, a softball team, uh, four teams could actually rent all the spaces, which then that brings another uh, sport into the mix to where it, it's going to be limited availability for, I mean, for the line share youth participation in sports. So what's your vision? Well, my vision is, is with the rectangular fields, you're gonna see more rectangular sports that will be participating on those fields, or the multi-purpose fields. Um, that's the vision that I see. My my main thought process, and I think the group's main thought process with the, with the multi-purpose fields was, we wanted to be able to make them as multi-purpose as we possibly could. So if we can play softball on those fields, that's great, we can. Um, but from a visionary standpoint, um, you know, we're looking at the rectangular sports for primarily for the multipurpose, lacrosse, soccer, football, rugby, those types of things for that. Now, if we get into a situation and, uh, you know, we have a softball field there and, and there's a softball tournament per se that, that you can use that facility, it wouldn't be like every weekend, but if it's a weekend that you could use it, then that would be something that we would look at. But Again, the vision would be primarily for those fields on the actual rectangular side to be used for rectangular sports is what we would be looking at. And from a scheduling purpose, you know, I mean, it'll take, it'll take a lot of thought to, to make sure that you do this, but you know, this is something that Chuck Muncy does right now currently um, with, with our athletic fields and uh, does a terrific job with it. It's not an easy job because you've got so many different irons in the fire, basically. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to add another dimension to it, but I, I think this is a dimension that we much need and, uh, um, and one that we look forward to, to, to working with so that we can 
really meet the needs of the citizens, uh, you know, all, the, all in, in all aspects, you know, whether it's, you know, softball, whether it's lacrosse, soccer, football, rugby, whatever it might be. And I, I'll say just from my perspective, Henry, that uh, I, I approach it as probably sort of from the girl softball aspect. That's what I coach, that's what I enjoy, that's what my girls play, that's what I've been involved with for many years. When I look at the three rectangular fields, honestly, I look at that white line as a theoretical white line. I don't foresee, I think what it does that allows us to, in bidding power, if you have an ultimate world series on your softball, you, you can basically say now I've got an additional four fields that will be available for a large regional or East Coast type tournament. But I always look at those white lines there again, it's, it's theoretical. It just shows that we, it's so multi-purpose you can use it for so many different things because it's so big. But I, I don't have a vision of that being used for softball at all up there on the recreational field, so not one bit. Uh, I just, I just, again, that white line is there. I feel like that white line draws a lot of attention because it's a white line, but it's only to show that you could if you needed to, or if you could if it, if it came down to, like, you know, one weekend or it was a big tournament or something like that. I, don't, I just don't see that happening myself. But, but if it's, you know, being that those would be actually, that's not baseball. It'd have to be softball, unless you're looking at eight year olds, nine year olds, maybe 10 year olds on a 225 foot uh, fence line. So. Henry, I can speak as a parent that has had a daughter that grew up playing softball and, and you know she's older now but the fight to get field time or to find a field that you can even practice on I mean I love the fact that we you know have a field on here because it's something that we desperately need you know we have been very limited through the years the rec department's done a great job utilizing the fields that we have but 10 years ago they didn't look like that or we didn't have access to them so I I appreciate the fact that we do have one more field on there for the girls that's upcoming in softball. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, the question wasn't to pit one sport against mm -hmm. another. Who's participating more in this? Who's participating more in that? But there is a need, and you can and it, you can say there is a softball need. I've served on council with the court for a number of years, and I know there's a need. I hear about softball every other week of us. So, <laughs> but, you know, and and it. And we are paying for probably some of our past, not, uh, and I think we have a, Brad, I think Brad's doing a great job. I think the recognition's doing a great job. But you have to remember, the question was asked because Harkrader was initially presented to council with two multi-purpose fields, and they were. I've seen the diagrams, but it's never been used for any multi-purpose sports. So there is a concern there with the lacrosse and the soccer and, and they are, when you talk about participation, or at least soccer, and that's something I know, that, that's a huge turnout. And really not, not a burden to the town tax dollars at all. So the concern is since, you know, you've had one facility dedicated to one sport, which is typically baseball, uh, more recently, I guess, they could share the when it was uh, not grass infield. There's concern there that is this going to be used for, and that's why it's a question. I'm sure Brad will do a good job bidding it up time. But there is a concern there when you see that. When you see, you know, certain fields are only used for certain things, even though they were presented, designed, the council for, you know, uh, multi sports. I think the one thing that uh, we've got going for us with this particular conceptual drawing and thought process is the artificial surface. Um, I think that's the most important thing of all this. I was pretty adamant about that to begin with, uh, because if you're going to use it as a multi purpose facility, you just can't do it with normal grass turf. If you do, you're not going to have a very good surface there. So I, it is. I don't want to pick on anybody, but there's a certain baseball complex within 20, 25 minutes from here. They do that. It's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's terrible surface. So I, I definitely think that um, you know, from a, the multi-purpose standpoint, the artificial surface is the thing that will really enable us to do a lot of things that. Maybe wasn't I wasn't here when Parkrader was designed and built, but I think it'll enable us to do a lot of things that maybe was hoped to be done out there, but hasn't been done. But I think it can be done with this. And to underscore what he's saying, our uh, consultant who did the market assessment also said that having the turf fields would draw more out of town use if that's something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Just one question. I'm glad you brought it up, Mrs. Dealer. I didn't want to ask real quickly, Mayor, if I may, but on the lacrosse. You're, you're, you're expanding by 20%, I think you said, in the last five years. Do you have membership, I guess, from all over? Is that Yes. Uh, right now, about at least half of our members are Christian for the And the rest of them may be in the county, I take it, or maybe Yeah, we have county. some. We have Ryan and Ray Bradford, Blacksburg. Right. Thank you. 
Well, I think one of the things that we have to look at when we're looking at the three multipurpose fields and the softball field is, you know, revenue generation. I mean, if, if someone wants to come in and have a world-class softball tournament at that facility, they're going to pay for it. They're going to pay dearly for it. And I'm not too sure what, what we, where we have thought, and I think we're way too early into the thought process, but, uh, you know, what kind of rental are you going to charge the clubs and the, and the, you know, the soccer and, the, and the lacrosse and this type of stuff? I think that's the next step we've got. Mm -hmm. I I think think that's part of the there business will be a film that I do say. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's the business plan. And, you know, you know, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, uh, obviously, we want to take care of our citizens first. That's the most important thing. Um, but, but along with that, um, by being able to have facilities like this, we're taking care of our, our citizens. But we also have the opportunity to, to sort of be an economic impact engine and be able to bring folks in to the area, um, soccer tournaments, lacrosse tournaments, you know, a variety of different things. And, you know, you could easily envision, you know, seeing a lacrosse tournament on these fields, a swim meet at the aquatic center, and a baseball tournament at, at Heartbreaker. You know, I mean, you could easily envision those things. And I think when, you know, we get down to it, those are things that are pretty important to us. I had asked one question to Brad before, maybe you too. I, uh, it, you know, we have so much going on here, and uh, the maintenance sheds, the maintenance area, all of you are pretty, feeling pretty good that we have an adequate amount of space here to store all this equipment? Uh, yes, during the, the planning process, we had a number of meetings with the, the steering committee, and we talked about actual equipment that they would have, and uh, we do, we do feel like it's adequate. We actually started initially with just the maintenance building, but with input from um, from from the group, there was a full barn added for that for that very reason. Make sure there's adequate space for, for outdoor storage. Very similar to the size that's currently at Park Raider, um, and the one downside of Park Raider is, is we take up the majority of our maintenance space with mowers, tractors, and those types of equipment. So you have nowhere to move when you're in there. So Hence the reason why we decided to go a, a sort of a less expensive route and do a pole barn so that it's actually, it covers our equipment, but it opens up still maintenance space there. Then, you know, and, and J.D. will get into this a little bit more, but um, another area up next to the artificial surface area, we would also have storage there. Um, uh, also a little bit at the softball fields, if I'm not mistaken, on the end of the dugout. I haven't started talking about that building so, yet, so before we move yep. on, I'm going to circle back to that. Good discussion. Any any other questions before I pick back up? I'm sure you haven't thought of this, but I was wondering the distance between um, the fields, just as far as fans, like where parents sit and cheer they, from. Um, yes. Is that a they can place? locate in between, depending on which side the team is on mm -hmm. and which side. Okay. Um, you know, one side would be dedicated to team, the other side would be dedicated to parents and folks sitting to watch the game. Okay, it's hard to, it's just hard to tell how much space is there. It's about 50 feet between those fields. There would be portable seating is what we would use, portable uh, portable bleachers and portable stands. That way you, you can use it or you can take it all. And backing up, um, we mentioned uh, this building will serve both the multi-purpose fields, but it will serve field one as a, a press box, and it will also serve the softball field as a press box. It's a two-story building. JD will show you in a second exactly what it looks like. Uh, it'll have restrooms in it, and it has some storage um, as, as we were just discussing. Okay. area we're going to talk about is the passive use area um, and the open spaces. Uh, and this is an enlargement of that, of that same area we were just looking at. I'm going to start up here in the upper left hand corner. There's a, a small stormwater uh, retention pond. Um, we've <coughs> talked about all of the network of uh, leisure trails that will run through the park um, and tie together, um, but there's a series of, of trails here. And then there's three meadow areas, one here, one here, and then a large one here. Um, this is a uh, picnic pavilion, and it'll have restrooms in it. It'll be served and shared.
share the parking lot from the multi-purpose field, so you have direct access there. This will be an iconic uh, picnic structure. It's actually on the high point of the meadow, um, so it kind of sits up on a hill. And then um, there are two small uh, picnic structures here and here that will serve this large meadow area and then be also on that network of <coughs> leisure trails. Um, all these areas will, will have to rely on adjacent parking. So uh, this <coughs> meadow area would rely on parking from the core area. This meadow area would rely on parking from the core area or the multi-purpose fields. This meadow would rely on parking from the multi-purpose fields. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to JP talk about the buildings. <laughs> uh, so when we began talking about the buildings, we first talked about how the architecture of the building could serve as the identity uh, for the park. And that moved into a discussion of, of what's around the park. And one thing that kind of caught my eye, um, and I live locally here, so I've watched the construction of the bridge, the new bridge across Pepper Ferry there. And I like the, the feeling of permanence. You know, it's, it's a massive structure, and it feels permanent. So that's how I presented, uh, that's an idea I presented to the steering committee, and that was well received. So that's kind of the direction we took when we, we began designing the buildings, um, for, with the feeling of permanence. Good as the first slide there. So as we look at the amphitheater pavilion here, uh, you can see we, we use materials such as standing seam metal roof, fiber cement siding, and timber frame construction, um, all conveying a feeling of permanence, and all low maintenance materials, um, locally sourced as well. With the amphitheater pavilion, the thing that kind of drove this was the idea of a portable stage. The town uh, the steering committee talked about purchasing a portable stage that could not, not only be used here at the park, but downtown or elsewhere. Uh, so that really drove designing the size of this pavilion. And the idea is that that stage can be pulled in under the front of the pavilion here. And in plan, we've kind of shown it dashed in. and. The stage that uh, we designed around is about 28 feet tall when it's extended. So that really creates the rigging and the lighting structure, um, kind of a plug and play environment so that you're not building that infrastructure into this pavilion. Um, so you can see the timber frame construction up front here, and that would carry throughout the, the building. It's situated on the site plan so that the rear of the building looks out over the pond. So you'll see the back of the building, the roof slopes down to a lower, um, almost back porch kind of feel, uh, so that there can be some seating um, on the back side of that, looking out on the pond there. And then the front side, of course, is the high side here, facing the lawn uh, that would serve as seating. Within the structure itself, there's a rest, uh, two family restrooms, <coughs> storage, there's also a fireplace here in the middle. And as Kyle mentioned, this could, of course, serve uh, for events that may be uh, involved in the stage. But it can also serve as a corporate event uh, or just family reunion place um, when it's not serving the concert then. Go to the next one. You heard Kyle mention the Hilltop Pavilion. This would be at the highest point on the site. And so the idea here is a, a medium-sized pavilion. We have basically three different sized picnic pavilions on the project. A small, which is 12 feet by 12 feet, a medium size, which is 24 by 24, and that's this one. And then uh, the larger pavilion we're considering is the amphitheater pavilion. So this has a little bit different architecture than the other medium-sized pavilions. The other pavilions have a bathroom associated with them. This one does not. It's open, uh, looking out to be used off to the north. And it's the same architecture of timber frame, uh, stainless steel metal roof, stone, column bases, and again, that feeling of permanence and, and low maintenance. 
We talked a bit about the maintenance and support building. And as Brad mentioned, this is uh, the maintenance building is similar in size to the one at Park Crater. And it, it functions in a similar way too, in that here's the maintenance bay. There's an overhead door on this side and this side, so it's it's uh, pull through uh, function. There's an office associated with this building, as well as a restroom with a shower, and a break room with a small laundry area. And we heard from staff that the, the break room um, and the restroom with the shower were really necessary because of sometimes the long hours they were, I guess, preparing for a tournament. Um, and it's nice to have a place to clean up uh, if they want to stay for a game or, or if they're staying there uh, during the, the play of the tournament. Associated with that area, uh, Kyle mentioned the pole barn, and this is just an open pole barn structure, simple construction. Um, it's about 40 feet by 50 feet. As I mentioned, there are three different size pavilions, and here the small and the medium are represented here. Uh, again, the small is 12 feet by 12 feet, and you can see the same feeling of permanence, timber frame construction. Yes, right. Right. Is, that, is that 12 by 12 for someone to the roof size, or is that the slab size? It's, it's actually the column locations. Okay, so, so the, so the column okay. space is about 12 feet by 12 feet. Same with the medium sized pavilion here. So it's about 24 feet by 24 feet between columns. And each medium sized structure um, has a restroom facility associated with it. And you can see the same architecture uh, of the other buildings with cement board siding. Um, and a timber frame construction. The playground and splash pad building is situated here. It's actually two separate buildings under one roof. Um, we'll begin with the, the building to the left here. This is the multi-use room that can be rented for birthday parties. And the idea is that these are, are glass overhead garage doors. They can be opened up. So that this can actually be an open air pavilion looking out on the playground that it sits adjacent to uh, right here. Associated with this building is also an office space with windows with good views of the splash pad as well as the playground out this way. And then there's a family restroom that opens on to the multi-use room there. Now in the building to the right, we have a men's and women's restroom. Part of those is dedicated to a changing area. And then we have two family restrooms right here. And then mechanical space to serve the splash pad as well as the building infrastructure itself. As I mentioned, the two buildings are under one roof, so we provided a deep overhang uh, for covered seating area. So this would serve more of the splash pad area that occurs right here. And then again, thinking of it as kind of a back porch, wrapping around this side would serve more of the playground area. Mr. Price, you probably already said this, I think you did, but those restrooms on the right <coughs> side that are served in the splash pad, those are the extra large family slash changing red type restrooms, is that right? They are, yes, sure. yes. There are two of those family restrooms there, so those are kind of single use. There's also changing dressing areas within these, these gang, we call them gang toilets, so that's not a great <laughs> no, term. No, I, 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 not a great <laughs> term. <laughs> and again, the same vernacular with the timber frame construction, uh, lap siding, and, and metal frame, or uh, standing seam metal roof. Okay. So the, the soccer complex building is situated between multi-use field number one, located here, and, I'm sorry, multi-use field uh, number two, located here, and parking area uh, located here. So the idea is on a tournament day or some ticketed event, uh, you purchase your, your ticket. Here's the ticket booth, which 
is the first thing you come to here. Uh, you enter through the gates and then you immediately enter into uh, or under this roof structure. Again, this is two buildings covered by one roof. Um, two restrooms are available to your right here. As you come through to your left is a concessions area with two concessions windows. And then there are two family restrooms, single-use toilets right here as part of this building. And as you come through, uh, the, view, the view of those three multi-use fields open up, uh, opens up in front of you. And again, we provided some deep overhangs here for covered seating uh, outside of the concession stand. And then a bit of an area for covered seating um, outside of this building, both facing out onto those multi-use fields. And one thing I forgot to mention is part of this building, there's a tournament headquarters space uh, that would serve for a tournament organization. And a small storage space to serve uh, the concessions building as well. Okay. The softball press box and support building, uh, it lies between multi-use field number one and the softball field here. So it serves as press box for both fields. Um, it actually has a second floor press box that I'll get to in a moment. But look at it on the first floor, and Brad mentioned this. This is a storage area, a fairly large storage area for the grooming machine that was used for the artificial turf. Um, as well as supplies that would be used for painting lines um, and what have for uh, those fields on that side of the park. There are four single-use family toilets here, two on this side and two on this side. And then there's an umpire's locker room here, as well as a small mechanical space. You'll see this is the stair leading to the press box, and again, we provided a deep overhang of the roof uh, to provide some sheltered seating areas on both sides that look out on the, either the softball field or that multi-use field. As you go up to the second floor, you can either turn left or right to go into uh, separate press boxes serving either the multi-use number one field or the softball field. And those press boxes have windows across the front and on the, the side to enable good visibility of the game. And again, the same architecture as the other buildings with the timber frame and the lap siding and, and standing seam over. Mr. President, if I can mention on this one, I just want to you know, make folks understand and, and be aware that what we're looking at is that first artificial surface rectangular field as being our primary main game field. If we have, you know, I don't know, if we had some type of soccer championship, lacrosse championships or whatever, that would be that premier field that we would be playing on. Um, and it just made sense to be able to save uh, from making another building is being able to do a press box for both locations out of that one. You know, from a softball perspective, it's not the most ideal location. Generally, it's behind home plate. But uh, I worked at Radford University, and we we worked for many years with a with a press box on the third base side, just like this one would be, and it was sufficient. Um, far as lacrosse, soccer, or football goes, it's pretty important to be able to have that press box as close to the middle of the field as possible. Um, so that's why that particular press box is in the location. That what kind of coverages are you going to have for field two and three as far as scoreboards? You know, operate the scoreboards. Is there a dugout type thing? Or will there be something built that will? I mean, I, you, I don't, I don't conceptually see any way you can service that far field from the the entrance. No, no. Building. We wouldn't do that. Basically, what will end up happening is what the design will be is there will be conduit underneath the actual turf fields. And, and basically there would be locations there where you just pull a section of the turf up and there would be connections there for scoreboards, PA systems, and those types of items. 
we would basically do a temporary setup at that point with like 10 by 10 tents and tables there. That way anything on the actual surface of the artificial surface can be set up and can be removed. You know, that way you've got a large open spot. Um, so that was, that's sort of the mindset of, of doing those types of things. So anything there would be temporary uh, and would just be set up just as I was mentioning earlier about like the player benches and fan stands and those types of things. Those would all be portable, be moved out and, and taken off. Question you haven't asked, but one. I guess sir, uh, this place didn't like the rec center, pointed it twice, and we have staff there. I won't have any staff here. Do we have any place if somebody gets hurt or first aid station? Or? Yeah, no, the, uh, that's a good question. I think in the details of the construction document design planning, we need to provide kind of first aid measures out here. Uh, but I believe you know, we've got set up so that we can have some office space. We've got an office, a tournament headquarters office at the soccer complex. We've got a better office space here at the main hardest core area. And then again, of course, the main facility itself. So we have an opportunity to have you know, some actual staffing on, on campus, as it were. And we will need staffing there. Um, it's going to be very important, very imperative to have staffing there. And the other aspect of it is, is you know, uh, um, from the actual artificial turf aspect of it, you know, in, in one of the discussions that came up was, you know, one of the people would be able to go and, and come as freely as they possibly can, you know. While that is a wonderful idea, you have to have some structure with it as well. And, and you know, at that standpoint, you would have to operate it somewhat similar as, as the recreation center to where you have staffing there, uh, you know, to ensure that the facility is taken care of. Like yeah. the what we're doing with the Huckleberry, would you have those blue safety cones anywhere throughout this? Well, that definitely would be something that we would really want to have, you know, with the infrastructure, of, you know, as we move forward, that will that will be a, a huge aspect to have throughout the walking trail. So, yes, to answer your question, that is something that I think is in there, of course, to have. Um, you know, we are looking at it, and that's the, the Bikeway Walkway Committee is, uh, we've given them a list of areas that we think um, would be very beneficial to have those types of towers, you know, with our current facilities that we have. They are basically on the process of, of moving forward to try to get sponsorship for those types of things. So once this facility comes into play, that'll be another area that, that we would do. The other items would be um, Wi-Fi throughout the park um, and, uh, you know, all kinds of different geo you know, mechanisms and those types of things to be able to get a little bit more updated with today's society. And uh, I think that all those things are pretty important. And uh, one one reason we had a, a, the steering committee is we had a member from the IT committee on there because we want us to have that vision as we move forward of what we need to do in those types of things. Brad, are we looking at any type of security grid at all for this? Cameras in particular areas that's discussed later? Uh, I think it'll be something that's discussed later, um, but uh, I, I definitely think that's something that we would look into. Um, you know, when you have a facility that large, you know, we have security systems here. Right. Right? It's, right. it's important to have those security systems, and uh, um, I think that's something we would definitely look at down the road. Would, would this be connected in any, any way? That, we have a really awesome early warning system for, yeah. uh, I guess, like the that's in miles. Yeah. yeah. And stuff like this would this be tuned into that where it'd be kind of more of a self-serve kind of alert we would still use our we would still use our current weather system that we that we currently use now which is uh, Schneider Electric which is NCA sure. approved um, there are ways to tie into that system right. to when lightning approaches within the 10 mile radius of what our lightning policy is that an alert system would sound you know it could be sirens it could be a lot of different things so that would be something that we would look at in the future once we get into a little bit more detail of the actual plan itself. Yeah, that, I mean, just on the ball field, that, that's a really awesome thing to know that we've got that. Well, and I, even beyond that, the playgrounds, <coughs> the open areas, you know, all of those areas, to be able to have that type of alert system, uh, I think very important. We'll, we'll be open 24-7. Mm -hmm. As far as the park goes, you know, most of our parks right now currently close at dusk. Um, That'll have to be something that we discuss as we move forward. You know, um, 
Uh, our athletic facilities, uh, we, we generally meet the curfew that, that's required by the town, so that's when we would shut the lights off and those types of things. And at that point, everything would be shut down. Uh, we did have, uh, uh, we do have lighting to the facility as far as the shelters and those types of items go, just for the simple fact that we do have, you know, whether it's local league games going on out there at nighttime or what, just so that we have lighting for the shelters if, if teams want to be able to go there, parents want to be able to go there and do those types of things. But uh, that will definitely have to be something that we'll look at. But right now, currently, our parks are set up uh, from an actual park perspective uh, uh, from dawn to dusk. A, a fellow asked me, he said he could not make it to the meeting today, but he wanted me to ask, and I asked Brad before the meeting, I bring that out, he was interested in basketball goals, and Brad mentioned to me that maybe some places in parking lots we're going to put up some goals there. I think that would be uh, conducive to you guys. I thought that was fine. Yeah, I think that if you look, if there's a lot of different, um, uh, some of the newer schools that were built in this area, you can see out in the parking lots of the areas that aren't used consistently, they have basketball goals that are that are listed right there beside of that actual parking lot and those types of things. And, I think those are things that uh, can be done once we get into a little bit more detail. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, I think you look, you know, at the time whenever the park is, uh, is open and, and um, you look at areas that maybe are not used quite as much as others, and those would be the areas that you would look at as far as being able to put like a goal or something there. And one, one more thing. I think we're going to have another meeting in, in June, and we're going to talk about finances. Is that right about the gas line and how much this will cost and maybe how much well, I'll, I'll keep to keep it up every year? How's that go? Yeah, so thank you. It's a good transition because I've got a number for you today. Um, the and we can but the, we we are working already with with basically arriving at this plan now. Building plans put together with clarity on what this is. Uh, I've kicked off the um, business plan back to Pro's Consulting to basically say. We've got building plans, we've got staffing to understand, we've got art, we know what's artificial, what's natural, uh, start developing that business plan. Uh, that will take about two months. Um, I just learned last week that one of the primary, uh, the right hand of uh, the gentleman we've been working with, she just went out with a premature baby born, so I guess the baby's fine, but uh, she's out on maternity leave, so. Uh, but we're, it's gonna take a two month kind of process to get the back and forth, and that'll be with town input There'll be a couple of drafts during those two months. It won't be just disappear for two months and come back. But the business plan really is uh, one of the most important pieces to, to put legs under this. Uh, otherwise, you have no idea kind of what you're getting into. You're, you're jumping in blind to an unknown. Uh, <clears throat> suffice it, I think it's going to cost money to own and operate this. There's no doubt about that. But it's a question of how much, what are, what are the expected revenues, uh, just what does it cost to maintain these kinds of facilities with staffing and, and mowing and, and artificial turf. All of that is going to get put into this splash pad for those print. The business plan puts all that together. Um, that is that is starting now and uh, should be before June for sure. We'll be able to, yeah, I was shooting for the end of April, but I think given the situation we're in now, we'll be creeping into May with that. With that. But um, <clears throat> but the, the the current cost estimate we have right now, the hard cost uh, for this, and again, I, I can't fathom you buying it all off at once, but if you were to develop all of this, pedestrian bridges, the, the pond, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of them. The hard costs alone are about $27 million. When you put in uh, contingencies, uh, or construction contingencies, soft costs for designs, also land acquisition costs, that, that number right there, to be clear, covers the road all the way up to Camrat and the roundabout. I'll make sure that's good. That's a, that's a four and a half million dollar piece of road. That 27 million covers all that? Or? Yes, sir. Of the hard costs. When you throw in the land and the engineering and the land acquisition down here, really the whole thing to go all the way, all of this and out to Cambria for that roundabout is at just north of $33 million. So um, we can, it's a lot. One of the pieces, you know, so the, uh, the more to come, right? We're not done today. Um, the, there's a few things yet to come. Beginning with um, watch the clock now. We've got 12 minutes to our open house across the hall. Um, and then uh, the traffic impact. We did a study with phase one at this intersection in Blue Park. We're now actually starting the process to study the rest of the impacts throughout the whole Windmill Hills and all the way back over to North Franklin. And what are the impacts going to be there? Uh, that's, that's starting underway. That'll be happening in the next two months. Um, and we have 
we've wrapped up draft versions now, and I hope you have to pin down engineering staff next week at the town to start reviewing stormwater feasibility, utility master plans, and uh, even the phasing discussion. If the phasing does, it's going to be one where I'm going to probably have to get back with you all when the business plan starts coming in and have some phasing discussions. Um, because if you say today, and I've got $33 million, well then great, I don't believe you, but if you said that, there's no phasing to discuss, we'll just take off and go. But if, if we start getting some direction on how, how many phases, how small phases, and then, then it's going to become the question of well, which things first. Uh, so phasing is not something I'm going to be able to do alone. Just come up with it on my own, live with what you got. Sure, you're talking about the phasing costs for the complete construction, hard costs, everything. And basically, that's where we would develop in, in, in segments. Basically. Right. You're starting to say, you know, we got to do the road first, or maybe it's just two lanes. So now that makes sense, the road first and the part that. I'm going to be honest with you, from my perspective, I'm not going to speak with the rest of you. I don't look at phasing. I look at the total costs and I look at uh, the project costs. And I think when we get down to phasing, it, the problem we're running into there is again, you know, I'm looking at one bond cost, if I'm looking at bonds, I'm looking at all this as a, a single as much as I can. But I know it's a big jig of feeling the cost of the Yeah, if we built the whole thing at one time, including the aquatic center debt, we'd be selling about $4 million a year just to service the debt. Mm -hmm. That's right. So get used to bumpy roads, guys. Well, but, well, and that's why I like about the business plan. I mean, that, that, that is our next step, let's be honest. And then with that, though, comes our opportunity to look at grants. Obviously, that's part of the RP process was mm -hmm. to have the individuals who can help us to find right. what I call free money, matching money, things like that. Mm -hmm. But also that operational cost. Now, we really want to develop truly. That's not going to be developed at the same time as the actual construction project total cost is. We're going to have two different business plans itself. It's going to talk about basically bifurcated projections for, for project costs and then operational expenditures, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the one thing that, getting to his, his question of phasing, mm -hmm. is that if you do plan on phasing the park, you'll want to have the business plan reflect that. Yeah. So that if you're right. just, right. say you're doing all the passive right. use stuff first, low, uh, you know, low operational cost, but right. we'll get into the active athletics, and if you don't build all of them at once, mm -hmm. then you want your business plan to, to reflect Absolutely. that. Absolutely. We want the business plan to be accurate. We want to make sure yeah. something to look at and stuff. I understand. You know, the way I see it here, this gas line is probably phase one, right? I mean, you, you well, don't yeah, look at it as phase one. Look at it that way, you're right. But you have to go that first. This summer, for the connector road, that is phase one. Yeah. What's our window there, Trevor? Uh -huh. when, they, when they break ground, they open that up, they do a segmentation type line, they segment that. Yeah. What, what time frame would it they like had, that? And they had laid out uh, July 11th through this day. They had a kind of a two week window where they're doing their work. We won't be able to do the work in those same two weeks right. because they're actually testing that line. I guess I'm looking at what kind of window do we have if we're looking at taking advantage of that opportunity. To say we're we're going to have to insert time into their schedule. They didn't have an extra two weeks in there, but my guess is it's going to take two weeks for us to do, uh, or to have them do for us that replacement piece, and then, then their testing follows after that. So our opportunity time is going to be between two and three weeks. That's yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. It'll be short. I mean, it, it's yeah. a, you mentioned six digits. Can you put some digits in those six digits? Yeah, uh, I, I really don't know. I, I begged, pleaded, cajoled, and asked them for like, come on. I, I told them in an email. I said, I need to know if that means one hundred fifty thousand dollars or five hundred fifty thousand. Right. What, what does that mean? I mean, just guessing. Um, if we phase this project out, yeah. I wouldn't have the cost higher. I'm sorry. Yeah. If we did the project by uh, one phase and. Say third phase, or would the cost be higher doing it that way? Yes, yeah, yeah. like anything, it, it would the remobilize, come back again and again. Um, uh, you would, and, and just the cost of construction year X versus X plus 10, yeah. you know, things are escalating. Um, but you know, it comes down to how much can you tolerate and how much can you bear at any yeah. given time. It also, it becomes very political who does what first, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah you can't help but see the right, do you build out this piece or that yeah. piece? And, and, it would be like the aquatic center, which do we do first? If we're going to phase that, do we do the family fun pool first, and then 10 years down the road we do the 50 meter pool? Uh, yeah. That's not how it works. It gets very political, and those of you who don't know Cord, could you guys tell he's a poker player? I mean, he is all in. But I just want to let everybody know. I want to let everybody know. Council would have taken these steps. I mean, we've spent some significant money. Phasing is going to be discussed. Um, the one kit boodle. Going to be discussed as well, um, and it, it could get political.
political in there, but council's serious about doing this. We wouldn't put the commission through this, our consultants through this, Game Hill through this, and spend this kind of money yeah. to just sit here and, you know, we're going to build uh, the amphitheater and let everybody, everything sit for another 20 years. We're going to say we're going to be financially responsible with going forward. Right. And I, I, I look at that total type of approach myself, but it all comes down to dollars and cents, all comes down to numbers. And I, and I, I trust that you know, the numbers we're going to get will be very accurate, and we have to be able to work with accurate numbers when we look at this. And that's why I appreciate you all taking the time and making sure those things that given us are very, uh, very, uh, yeah, very accurate. So, so. Uh, once we get the word to go, how long it take? Uh, if we did it all. Yes, oh, gracious. Uh, <laughs> three years, two years. Yeah, I mean, you're talking years, not months. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you'll think yeah, about it. Yeah, the construction of the park itself probably a year and a half, and then you're probably talking okay. know, six, 12 months to design it. And, um, yeah, a couple of years, probably. Right. Okay. Just putting that road in, it's going to take some time. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> Barry sitting over my shoulder and grinning because he's retired. <laughs> <laughs> That's somebody else's dog. Yes, it is. Trevor, I got one question. Uh, as far as the gas line goes, and I know there's a window there, when, is, when does there have to be a decision made on that gas line, you know, if, if we are to take advantage of that this year? I, I would think it's probably mm -hmm. soon. I, I think we should be trying to make that decision here in March. Um, I bet you April is the end of that window. True. Uh, well, and, and to make that decision, I, I agree. With you. That's why I was asked about that opportunity window. That's why I think you kind of give a little credence to what Steve asked. I mean, oh, are we looking right. at 150 or are we looking at 550? Right. Uh, I think or 950. Exactly right. Well, yeah, I mean, right. What I'm understanding is that if we don't do it now, we're looking at 750 or something. Yeah. And at this point, yeah. if we do take advantage of it now, now we're looking at. Who knows? We're able to get six figures, which is better than seven figures, but there's a lot of uh, yeah. lot of the big spectrum within that six figure. And that may be something that I need very this is uh, we need to try to call yeah, I good. Just the town manager to just sure. um, But I guess what I'm saying is we really can't make we're a call a tomorrow until we know what those figures are. I understand and I agree because that needs to happen, needs to happen sooner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 Sure. We're, we're getting, and, and there are lots of concept questions, and I'm sure that you and your staff are going to be out there doing this, that, that our people can talk to you on the side, but we've got about five minutes to move over and set everything up. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, Diane, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I want to thank you all again for all your hard work and everything you've done for us, and I'd like to adjourn the meeting on my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would... Uh, we don't normally need a motion to adjourn a work session, so I will adjourn our work session.